Okay, so in this session, we will be learning to build a transaction alert cube with Bolt IoT. Uh, so uh, for the software, you will be needing basically the Arduino IDE, which uh, most of you must be familiar with, or you can also use Visual Studio Code with platform IO to write the Arduino code. And for uh, fetching the transactions uh, uh, from the mail, we will be using Java. So I will be using IntelliJ, but you can use any Java ID or whatever. And um, you will be needing a modern web browser for basically authenticating your mail and setting up uh, everything. And for the hardware requirements, you will um, need a Bolt IoT module, obviously, uh, and Arduino Nano or Uno few jumper cables and I will be using some addressable LED strip uh, so that I can make some cool animations with it, but you can use any LEDs or whatever. Okay, so the first thing that you need to do is to uh, to basically read your transaction emails. Uh, so, um, well, uh, we will be particularly dealing with Gmail only. So, uh, yeah, so if your bank account is linked with some Gmail account, then you can follow along and it the process may be a little different for other mails, but we'll be dealing with Gmail only in this session. So the first thing that you need to do to uh, read your mails from Gmail is to basically enable the Gmail API. My screen is visible. Right. So to enable the Gmail API, you need to go to So uh, first you will go to this website right here, developers.google.com slash gmail slash API, then get started. Now I will be using Java. You can use any other language too. In under quick starts, go to Java. Now the first thing that we will need to do is to we'll need to create some credentials. Now to create those credentials, what you can do is you can go to cloud.console. I think you can type in Google console and uh, go here console.cloud.google.com on this link over here. Once you are here, you will need to create a new project and maybe you have to set up your account also with some details. And like I have created some projects. So right now I'm in this project, Bolt Transaction Alert Box, the same project. The first thing that you will need to do is to go on the search bar over here and type in Gmail API. Uh, all the questions will be answered in the end. And also this session is being recorded. So if you lose your internet, then there is no issue for that also. And then uh, like I have currently enabled the Gmail API. That's why I'm seeing this manage button, but uh, uh, is there some issue with the audio? Uh, 
um, what link? Uh, all the links will be shared in the end of the session. So it's basically this. So let me share it now if you're asking. So it is cloud dot google uh, console dot cloud dot google dot com for the console and for this it is developers dot google dot com slash gmail slash api and then you have to select java in the quick starts that's the link now since i have already enabled the gmail api I, i'm seeing the manage button here If you have not enabled it, you will see the enable button. So then once you have enabled it, you will go to the manage section. And then you have to generate your credentials. So after going to the manage section, like I've already created my credentials and um, I won't share them here, otherwise uh, someone can authenticate someone on my behalf, but you just have to click on your create cred credentials. And uh, mm, I think it is OAuth client ID. Then you have to select application type and select desktop app, and you can name it anything you want. And then click on create and you will get your credentials. Once you get your credentials, yeah, all the recordings will be available in the end. So once you get your credentials, you will need to download your credentials from here. Like I've already created my credentials, so I'm not creating again. So you just have to click on this download button and download your credentials once you have once you have downloaded your credentials what you need to do is you need to rename rename the file that you have downloaded let me show you so once you have downloaded your credentials you'll need to set up a new project so if you have intellij installed what you need to do is to go to file new then project now here you have to select gradle and you should use java 16 maybe and then then you need you need to select java here in the additional libraries and frameworks then you need to uh, click on next Next, you need to give uh, some name for this project. Like I gave my project the name Bold Transaction Box, but you can give it any name. So let's uh, let's call it um, anything like random. Once you are done with this, you just need to finish this and open this. Once you have opened this, what you need to do is this build.gradle file will come up. And what you need to do is you need to empty the contents of this file. And what you need to do is to go to this here and you have this, this content, you just have to copy it and paste it, right? And here in the main class name, uh, you, get, you have to give the name for your main class. Like maybe if you, the name is main.java for your main class, the class in which you have the avoid main method. Okay, because it's the method, it's the entry point of your program. So since for me it's main, so all you need to do in this Gradle file that we just copied and pasted, you have to change this to main or whatever your main class name is in which there is the main method. Okay. Once you have done this in IntelliJ, you will see this kind of an icon. Once you, once you cl uh, click on this, all the library dependencies will be installed. 
and then you can use all the uh, Google uh, libraries and all that required for accessing Gmail. So this was the process for setting up the Gmail API. Yeah, one more thing that I have to mention the file that you downloaded uh, uh, right now. So the file that you downloaded has to be put inside this. Actually, um, if you want, you can actually delete this one. This is not required. You have these two folders. So inside the Java, you can add a package or just directly start adding classes. And inside the resources folder, you have to uh, paste the file that you downloaded from over here. Inside this resources folder. So like I open it in Finder and inside this resources folder, I will paste that file and I will uh, rename it to uh, credentials.txt just like I have done over here or credentials.json like this. And I have to paste this inside the uh, this folder. So once we are done with this, uh, the next thing that we need to do is to write the code for fetching the mail and uh, finding if uh, a transaction has happened and identifying the kind of transaction and uh, um, notifying the Arduino. Also. So uh, now let's go to, um, so let's first see the Arduino code because that would be easier maybe. So like many of you might be familiar with the Arduino ID. Uh, so I'm using a uh, platform IO, which is an extension for visual studio code uh, that you can use to like uh, make embedded projects for any platforms like Arduino or any platform like that. So the first thing that I have done is, so to create any project in platform IO, first you have to install visual studio code, obviously. And you can use Arduino ID also, you don't have to do all this, but then you can go to, plat uh, you can go here and then install platform IO. And then what you will get is, you'll get this kind of an icon over here. And next time when you want to make any new Arduino project or something, you just have to click on this open button, then click on new project. Uh, give your project a name, like again, random. Select the board you are using. For example, you can be using Arduino. Arduino functions like digital or digital, it's a select this also. And then you can select this location that it has chosen or you can override it. You can choose any custom location you want. And then you just have to click on finish. And then your project has been made and yeah, it's pretty simple. So you can check it out later if you want to. Like this is my random project, but I will close it for now. So remove folder from workspace. So let me clear this up first. So uh, first, so here in the platform our project, like let me close all the folders so that it's cleaner. So the first thing that you will have is this file, platform any. So like um, you can make, uh, you can write the code for multiple boards by making different environments. Uh, but uh, you don't have to worry about all this. If you just selected Arduino Nano, uh, this other thing I made because I was also working with an Arduino, but you don't have to worry about this. So we'll just leave it. 
so there will be few things will be already put here like if you have selected arduino nano in this file you will already find these three things platform is atmel avr your uh, framework is arduino and then we will uh, like i'm using an addressable led strip so to use that strip uh, i will be using the fast led library so the any libraries you want you can uh, install by right just typing in lib underscore depth is, is equal uh, equals to the name of the library so you, unlike arduino id you don't have to download the library and add the file you can just uh, add and you can add many libraries by writing this lib depths equals like any library you want if you want bolt iot a bolt iot helper library you can write it here and uh, it will install that for you so it's very convenient so next in the include folder you have all the header files you want to put like you can define all the constants and all that and in the source file you have the main file and here instead of main dot you know you get main dot cpp um, and you have to um, uh, include the arduino dot h header file manually in the arduino id it's automatically done for you so you don't have to worry about this but here you have to uh, uh, add it this is not required so the first thing that i do is i uh, i create an uh, array of uh, leds for my uh, led strip so for that i have 60 leds so all the all these con constants for the leds are defined here in the num leds.h file so i've defined that and here this pragma once means that um, all these constant will be included only one time. So like if you have, uh, so like if this file is included recursively, like through other header files also, this is included. So this will not be included multiple times. This will only be included one time. So it's better if you write pragma once here. Once, uh, and then I, I have I, I have 60 LEDs that I can address and individually set the color for all of them. So I've defined 60. Then I have defined the data pin, which is three, meaning uh, uh, I will be using pin three on the Arduino port to send the data. And they just use one line to like set all the colors and all that. And now the fast LED library supports a lot of uh, different kind of LEDs. But I will be using particularly WS2812B LED strip. So that's why I've selected this. And then what I have done is in the main.cpp, I have um, put fast LED dot add LEDs. And then these are the, uh, the template arguments for this. So uh, uh, the LED type is this, the data pin is this, and GBR means that uh, the way the data will be sent will be the at first the green color data will be sent, then the red color data will be sent, then the blue color data uh, will be sent. And uh, uh, these angle brackets you see is actually a template. So basically, um, there are many different uh, classes for which uh, this. Uh, there are many different kind of LEDs, like right. So, so like if there are, so um, uh, this template basically does what is um, it basically substitutes the appropriate class in this add LEDs method. So we don't have to write multiple versions of this add LEDs method. If you are not aware about templates, then you can just find it about it on Google. So then here we have a uh, uh, what is yeah this is these are the, our function arguments then so so this was our, our template and these are our function arguments so here i have passed the array of leds and the number of leds then i have set a delay for 1000 milliseconds or one second so that everything becomes stable and then i've i've started the 
serial communication at 9600 9, words per second. So next, what I do in the word setup is I set all the LEDs to black. Uh, basically, uh, this just sets uh, them to black in memory. And to actually apply that, you have to call this fast LED dot show method. So now it basically initializes all the LEDs to black, basically it turned off. Next, what we do is we wait until the serial is available. I mean, some data is available from the bolt. So uh, basically I've connected the Arduino and the bolt using UART. And so then I read the, uh, so uh, serial.read returns one character uh, of eight bits uh, per read, right? So next I read this character C. Now, if C is equal to Wi-Fi connected, which is basically W, I've defined it for, I think this transaction, kind, yes. So here, so I've defined Wi-Fi connected as W, uh, fraud as F, uh, general debit as four. Basically why this general debit is there? Because uh, like uh, some banks don't send that, uh, basically don't mention in the mail whether the transaction was made online or on POS machine. So if that's the case, we can uh, go for this one. And if the money is credited in your account, then this one, and if it is spent on ATM, POS, uh, meaning point of sale, like in a store or something online or for that, this one. So these are the constants I've defined. And then here, whatever the bolt has sent to the Arduino, like when, uh, initially, uh, when the bolt is initiated from Java, it will send this thing. Uh, it will send a W, meaning that it will notify the Arduino that it is ready. Next, uh, and then I've put it inside this loop and instead of delay microseconds, I can use delay also. That's better. Uh, so now here I have, I have, uh, so then what we do is we loop over all these. And once we play the appropriate animation, like if the, if C was Wi-Fi connected, then it will play the Wi-Fi connected animation. If it was an ATM transaction, these animations will be played using the LED strip I will show you in a moment. And if it was a point of sale transaction, it will uh, play the POS animation. If it was an online transaction, it can do online in animation and all these kind of different animations. Then we wait for one second and then clear LEDs basically is a macro that sets all the LEDs to black. And uh, yeah, after that, we need to call actually fast LEDs dot show so that it actually does this. And then we just print the character that we did and then we loop again. So after that, if Bolt sends like online transaction for that, it sends two, then we can play that animation. Now, for the animations, I have made some macros. So instead of writing functions, I've made macros. So, because I think it will be a bit more performant because it will not require calling the function and then returning from it. So like, this is the ready animation macro. Okay, some of them are not even used. Like for the ATM um, animation, what I do is I define the macro, then you just have to put pound define and then uh, name of the macro. Next, you just pass in whatever the arguments is. And then you just, write, you, just write, you just write them as just write. So then, uh, then you just write like uh, regular functions. And basically, uh, uh, 
to change if you are writing a multi line macro so at the end of every line except for the last line you have to put this slash if it's a multi line macro like in a function you could you could just write multiple lines without any thing but here if you are going if you are continuing on the next line put a slash over here put a backslash like this and in the last one it's not required So like I have different kind of animations over here, and you can just go through these and these are basically some basic animations. Then I've showed you the this file also and in the config.h I do some basic stuff like setting the serial pod rate, uh, setting the rx pin, the tx pin and the uh, bolt interrupt pin is not being used right now. So oh, earlier I was uh, thinking of using interrupts, but then I thought it would be super complicated. So this is this constraint won't be used anymore. So still we can just keep it there. And yes, yeah, so this and yes, in this header file I have defined I have put the declaration for these functions because the uh, in the Arduino ID what you can do is if you want to call a function, let's say. Uh, void a then you can just write and if you want to call it from a function above it like here then in the arduino id it will be completely fine because it automatically uh, adds a declaration for it over on the top but uh, in case of platform io uh, since it's using raw c plus plus it doesn't do any pre-processing of it i mean the c pro the c plus plus preprocessor is different and arduino uses its own preprocessor right so that just adds the declaration of the functions on the top but here it doesn't so if you try to compile it like this it will show an error that's why you have to put the declaration before that's why i included this header.h and inside this header.h, I have declared all the functions that will be called. Because otherwise, the compiler would not be able to find it while compiling. So we don't need this. So next, uh, we have to do the Java. So IntelliJ, yeah, I can close this random project because it's not needed. So in the Java, uh, we have some classes. So uh, here I have, uh, uh, this file is, of no use right now. So here I have two files. One is this credentials.json file that you have downloaded from uh, the console. And the other one is the old credentials.txt that I have made. So basically this file contains the API key and device ID, which basically, uh, which I cannot show here live, but let me just create a duplicate file to show you in what format you have to enter it. So let's create a text file. So a scratch file, let's say. File. Like uh, b.txt. Now here you have to just do that. Like if, if you, you have to, in the first line, you just put your API key, whatever it is. And in the second row, you just put your bolt device name, whatever it is. And you don't have to put any other character here, just API key, enter key, bolt name, just that. And yeah, that's it. And then what I did, what I do is, 
so the, uh, so so this is the thing so you just put your api key on the top and then press the enter and then just put fold device id so this is important so i can now delete this file now to load this file i have made a class called bolt uh, bolt credentials loader so here we have our file input stream to take the input from the file and then we have the string api key and string device id then what we do is in the constructor for this class we try to open the file input stream with the file path that the user provides basically the path of this file and copying that is also very simple just I just right click here copy path and you should uh, try copying the absolute path because the uh, output of the compiled java is somewhere else so using relative path might cause some problems so so i will show you that also so here we take a string path name and then you just have to do file file input stream equals to new file input stream and pass in the uh, path name and uh, if it cannot find the file it will uh, throw in the file not find exception so which you can handle it over here and then uh, now the way this uh, file input stream um, takes data is it just takes in raw bytes uh, bytes of data meaning uh, eight bits pairs like it takes raw bytes and it reads raw bytes so we have some raw bytes equals to null and raw string equals to null so it just reads it as bytes so first thing we do is we declare the byte array and then we do this uh, file input stream dot read all bytes and if it is unable to read any byte let's say the file is empty or not present then it will throw an io exception which you need to handle and then we have the uh, to to construct the raw string basically this raw string will contain the entire file in form of a string right so to create the string so as you know that string is a class but uh, it's a reference type so if you are familiar with java you know that but most of the time we just declare a string like that but since it's a class, there is a constructor for that and there is an overload for the constructor of the string class. Let me show you. So like I just pressed command P. So there, these are all the overloads for the constructor available. And there's an overload for the constructor that takes in bytes, raw bytes, and then converts it into strings. So we uh, so we are using this overload of the constructor here. So we are just writing raw uh, raw string is equal to new string of raw bytes. Next, what we do is we split the uh, uh, string uh, with we split the string with the uh, new line character. So basically, uh, like I told you, so like anything we want. So like I told you, in the first row, we write the API key and in the second row, we write the device name. And you and uh, you know, when you press the enter key, a backslash in character is added here. That's how the, your computer represents uh, basically a new line. And its Unicode value is added here. So when, so what, what we do is we read this whole file as a string and then we split by finding this new line character. So the first, uh, so when we split like that, we get an string array and the first index of that array is the, let me show you. The first index of the array is the API key because it was the, it was before that uh, new line character and the next is the device ID because it was after that new line character. Next I've put the getter methods here. And uh, so they just return the API key and uh, device ID 
and yeah so this is how we securely read bolts credential without like hard coding them in the code and like if you have to swap them we can just swap them here and it's even secure here so it's never a good idea to hard code them and then i have the bolt module class so here i have basically the source url for at which so like um so i hope you all know how to enable the bolt api but let me show you so what you need to do is you need to go to cloud.boltiot.com and then basically sign in with your account and then you have to go in this api section and i think if i'll click it my api clearly visible or not no it will not be then here you have to generate your api and enable it and you can see it from here but i won't show you here and you have to copy it and then you know the device id of that bolt you are using so once you have done you have to just generate an api key that's pretty simple so next what we do is we in the bolt module class we put the so like like now to basically call this api you have to click on here and like select whichever function you want and what do you want with which bolt you want click on build api request and as soon as you do that you will get a url and based on how that url looks like and you can look at in the documents of the documentation of bolt iot also i think you will get to know like how to how do how did i create these urls like here in the api request sections like here this is the format http cloud.boltiot.com slash remote slash your api key command and then yeah it's pretty straightforward so first i have the source url next i have defined all the pins for the bolt and basic stuff here and i have two constructors one can take it api key device id and border it for the serial communication and yes i have taken the serial border it uh, over here only because you know uart is an asynchronous communication so there is no clock signal so both the device should agree on a particular data transmitting and receiving rate so that the data can be synchronized so we are we are using 9600 here also so next we quickly just loader dot load api key this is the bold credentials loader and then border it and then we concatenate the api key with the source url then from here only we call the uh, begin uart method and we send w which if you remember in the arduino code was to signify that uh, it's now ready now in the in this function basically what we do is here to begin uart we just add the appropriate arguments and then i have a network manager class which i'm going to show you that 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 just returns the request as a string and then we check if it contains this and how did i get this this is whenever you make an api call to bolt it replies in this kind of a json format and if the other argument success is to one is written meaning that the command is successful so it's pretty basic you will get it and so you have the send data function digital write function restart function and this send data with interrupt function does what is basically it firstly um, um turns on and pin our, on the arduino to send an interrupt and you know we are not even using this function and then it sends the data then it pauses the execution of the code for one second so the current thread that's running so basically if you don't know that then uh, basically a thread is a list of cpu instructions that uh, that basically your program is compiled to to write the cpu executes a instructions so it's just a list of cpu instructions and data so basically we are saying that we are 
pausing the program for one second in simple terms. And then we are turning the pin off to, uh, yeah, this is an advanced function and we are not even using interrupts. So if you are want to interrupt your bolt, send some data and then basically this is used if you want to save some energy and all that so that you can put the Arduino in sleep, interrupt it from sleep by uh, turning a pin on, send some data, turn it off. And then if all these three requests uh, succeeded, then return true, otherwise return false. And then this reset function I just created. Yeah, so it's pretty basic. So next, let me show you the network manager. So the network manager basically uses some uh, Java API for making a network request. So basically we do what is, we do HTTP request request is equal to, we call this HTTP request dot new builder. Next we in the, in this, then we have to uh, put the URI, the unique resource identifier. I think it's identifier only. So yeah, identifier you, then we have to pass the, then we have here in this function, we need to create a URI. So we use URI.create and then here I am passing a string URL on in the, on this URL, the request will be sent. So I'm sending in this and I'm, and as so if you don't know, then port API uses get method for receiving the request. So oh, I hope you're familiar with this. There are two kinds of, there are, I think more, more kinds of, but mainly we use get request and post request. So in the get request, the, the information or the data is the part of the URL only. And in the post request, it's sent as a request body. So like, uh, like all the all the Bolt APIs have the uh, request as the part of the URL only, so they just use get request and then dot build to build this object, to build this HTTP request object. Next, here we have an HTTP response of uh, and uh, it's of type string. So again, like this is a generic class. So basically if these HTTP response uh, can be uh, like of, can return anything, like maybe it can return JSON or maybe it can return anything else like integer or whatever. So here we are returning a string. So we are passing in a string so that, uh, so basically it's a generic class. So you understand the meaning of generic, it's generic. It can return any type. If you don't know about generics, that's a pretty simple in introduction. You can just learn about generics if you don't know about it. It's like templates in C++. So basically we are saying that it will be maybe uh, returning a string. So next here we try in the try block, what we do is we do response is equal to HTTP client, which is us dot new HTTP client dot send. And here we pass the pointer to our request object. And here we need to um, pass our body handlers. And since we are using string, we are passing body handler of string. And if there is an um, exception, then you need to handle it and you can print some message. Next, you can print the body if you want and then just return the request body, whatever. Okay. So yeah, then so like, Next, we have our uh, main class. So in the main class, what we do is, there's some things that are not required here. We can remove them later. Yeah. So first we do what is, we take the uh, bold credentials loader, loader is equal to new bold credentials loader. Uh, I showed you this class. This is for loading the bold credentials from the file. And then what I basically did was I, I clicked on this file. I click on copy reference and I copied the F root path to this file right over here. Okay. So next what I do is I have a bold module 
module is equal to new bolt module and here i pass this loader so it can use the you can it can use this loader to load the api key and device id and then we pass in the border it next what we do is we have a box object and and this box is the actual transaction box that will be using the bolt module so what we do is we pass the control of this um, uh, bolt module to the box object next we have the transaction finder that finds the if there is any transaction in the mail so it so here we pass in the box object so if it finds a transaction it will notify the box object and then the box object will notify the bolt and then the bolt will tell the arduino i, I will show you all of this and then we have a mail polar that just keeps on uh, polling the mail server for new mails polar is equal to new mail polar and then here we pass in the finder so it will keep polling the server and it will use this finder and send the mails to this finder and see if there is a transaction and then we have polar dot start uh, polling let me just show you all of this one by one so like first we should see the um, let's see the box class so the so there is an interface i made called the transaction handler interface so basically here is the transaction handler interface so if you don't know what an interface is so an interface is basically like a, a set of rules that a class has to follow like if any class implements this interface it should have this method so that some functionality can be used so like it it should have some functionality like for example uh, like uh, like here we have putting that we are declaring this method meaning if any class implements this interface it has to provide an Im implementation for this method right so uh, basically this means that here in our uh, where was it box our box implements a transaction handler meaning it has to provide this function where we can handle the transaction and you can actually write here override like this and basically what this is is that it is an uh, annotation and it provides extra information to the java compiler um uh, like is that hey this is an overridden method so next we override this method because we are implementing this interface so we are doing a contract with it that will provide this functionality so if this transaction is not null because this if there is no transaction if it's because we will be scanning the entire mailbox right and not every mail is a transaction mail so if transaction if there is um, if the mail is not a transaction mail we will be passing null here right null means nothing so we need to check if it is not null then what we'll do is we will send so i showed you in the main class we pass to the bolt module to the box object so over here we need to pass so then we do it what we do is we do m bold dot send data integer dot to string because it takes a string so we need to and then t dot get kind or transaction dot get kind i will show you the, the transaction object next and if transact and transaction object also has a method called is fraudulent object and if it is fraudulent it sends and f to the bolt module telling it that it says fraudulent which then it forwards to the arduino and if it find a transaction it returns a one and if this if block is never uh, executed it will return a zero so now let's see the transaction class so here in the transaction class what we have is 
we have a male class object and this male class is made by me only let i will show you and we have the message so basically the male class is quite simple it basically it just stores the message and it it has some functionality like uh, if there is some time provided inside the mail like at what time the transaction has happened and that so there is just one method so basically it stores the ma mail as a string so where would i where was i here so here we define some constants like final int atm is equal to zero for atm transaction for pos transaction for online transaction for credit transactions like refunds or the cash deposit or uh, and here we provide a general debit basically if the account is like i told you like many banks don't share if the transaction was a pos transaction or an online transaction like so that's why we have this next what we do is here in the constructor we pass in a mail and we'll get to that soon and then what we do is and here we have a message field also and here what we do is we do mail dot get message dot to uppercase because you see we are do, we convert it to uppercase because i'm comparing in uppercase only so if i don't turn it to uppercase and if the mail contains it in lowercase then um, it won't be detected because the unicode values for uh, capitals are, and smalls are different so yeah i need to be quick so so if mail contains atm and contains debit we return the constant atm if it contains pos we return pos if it contains uh, online and debit it returns online constant and yes and else if it contains debited because like i told you point on or pos or online is sometimes not mentioned by the bank so in that case we can just return the general debit and for the credit transaction we check if the mail contains imps neft upi deposit refund transferred any of these keywords should be present along with these any of these keywords should be present credited refunded or reversed then we can return the credit constant and if nothing is there we can return minus one and here in the um, this fraudulent method what we do is we uh, take the we have a fraud detector class and fd is equal to new fraud detector and here we pass in the mail and we return there is a looks fraudulent method and we can name it this one also looks fraudulent because we are not 100 percent sure if it is and we just return this and in the fraud detector i've done something really simple so uh, in almost all the banks the time is for the transaction will always be sent in the 24 hours unit so 24 hours unit will be used so it won't be using like am and pm it will show and this is github copilot showing all the so like here we can also have this is just auto complete coming yeah i can disable it from here yeah so here in the fraud detector what i do is so as i told you that uh, so basically like if you uh, like i'm assuming that uh, no one does transactions between uh, 12 am in the midnight till 6 am so basically i'm not doing any complex logic here i'm just saying that if the transactions are between uh, 12 to 6 we will call it fraudulent and to do that what i'm basically doing is uh, uh, in the fraud detector what we are taking is is a, a mail object and we'll see the mail class uh, just now we'll see it so basically what we do is we store this mail uh, over here in this field and the time for the time which is present we get it with this method and then we get the message in the mail using get message 
if time is not equal to null meaning if it, it may be the case that there is no time present and maybe you are looking at a mail that is not even a transaction email so what we do is for a string fraudulent time um, if, this is a for each loop if you are not familiar with it so basically what it will do is it is just like a for loop but what it will do is um, it will go through all the values one by one so like first zero index will be loaded in the fraudulent time in the next step in uh, in the next iteration the first index will be loaded in the next iteration second index will be loaded and it will continue on so it's basically like a for loop but we don't have to worry about indices and all that and you can just do a regular for loop and we check if the time dot starts with any of these and if it starts with any of these i call it fraudulent so return true otherwise return false it's quite simple next in the mail class uh, we have uh, like the mail so basically we pa uh, pass in the, a string and then we store it in this message and then we have this public string get message to get this mail then we have public string get time in payload and here what we do is we extract the time using an extract time method i will show you that also and then we i have a time format class and we do time format dot validate time to make sure that mm -hmm. it is in the right format and if it is not in the right format we'll return null otherwise it's in the time and then what we have is the extract time method so what it does it it does is like uh, the way it, this method returns uh, the uh, so the way we store the time or we get the time is that uh, like minutes and hours and seconds are like um, split using this uh, same uh, this colon so basically what we do is we split the entire message using this colon then we traverse uh, from uh, this entire array and we do that time format is correct hours format meaning the hours part is present and if the next uh, if the next thing present is it in the minutes format like if this was zero zero is two and if it was if if it was zero zero and it was also like something like zero two, so we have two digits here and two digits in the adjacent and <coughs> so like if it was something like zero zero is two one two if something like this was stored, <coughs> then when we split it it will be splitted in zero zero and one two so we check that if first one is also a number and second one is also a number in this format kind of then what we do is we return the time in this format <coughs> and then using this validate method in the time format class we validate it and here is the time format uh, class it's basically a simple class and i'm coming to the main classes which deal with the email so like we have correct hours format and correct minutes format and these two are boolean so we check uh, initially we set them to false and here in the validate method we check if this is true and this is true and we return this boolean expression so if so is correct hours format here we go from 0 to 23 and if i is less than 10 we check if time dot start with 0 is to i like 0 is to 0 0 is to 1 0 is to 9 and then else if time dot starts with it the so once the double digit comes in we don't have to add this 0 in the beginning so then here we validate this and i think that um, yeah so ah right so we check if it starts with zeros to zero zeros to one like that or it starts with any double digit uh, 
number or whatever and we check this for hours and then here we were even starts with and then we do the similar things from 0 to 59 for seconds and uh, uh, yeah all the questions will be answered in the end uh, so then here we do it what is uh, ends with uh, basically we check the same thing but for um, but for these uh, seconds so it's kind of simple so here i have shown you yeah this is the transaction finder er, okay so here in the transaction finder we have a transaction handler so basically what we do is we have this public transaction finder transaction handler it takes in so here are some transaction keywords that if present in a mail will mean it is a transaction email so like we have the transaction class in which like we were trying to identify what kind of transaction it is here we are only trying to identify if this mail contains a transaction or not so like uh, if things like paid payment received successfully cash withdrawal imps success rtgs success something like that is present what we do is first we have a get transaction method for again we use a for each loop so for string keyword in transaction keywords if mail dot get message dot to uppercase because we are using all these in uppercase only uh, dot contains meaning if it contains uh, the keyword so we are traversing over this array and we are checking if any of these uh, contains any keyword and as soon as we'll find it we'll return a new transaction otherwise we will uh, obviously return null and this transaction finder, uh, finder actually implements an interface called mail handler and i will tell you why i have implemented these interfaces but here i have an event and here in this event we pass in a mail object so let's just quickly look into it so now here if trans if if this get transaction so as soon as there is an event we do what is if get transaction of mail is not equal to null we return transactional ha handler dot get trans uh, uh, we call this transaction and handler dot transaction event and we pass in get transaction of mail so we take the get transaction method and pass in the mail in it and then what we do is we have a transaction handler here and we do transaction handler dot transaction event and this transaction handler can is nothing but our box so our box implemented this transaction handler interface and i implemented this interface because uh, currently we are passing in our physical box but it can be any service also or anything we can pass in that's why i implemented this interface so it, it promises to provide this common functionality and as soon as this transaction event method is called with this transaction it sends directly the data to the bolt module regarding the transaction by calling the get kind kind method on the transaction object and also calling ing is fraudulent method and sending if it is fraudulent and it returns a one if it is successful or a zero if it is unsuccessful now we come to the let's say uh, mail fetcher so here the mail fetcher uh, uh, class uh, most of it can be built using like on this page we were developers at google.com slash gmail slash api slash quick start so here a lot of code can be just copied and pasted from here you can change the class name and there are a few things that you need to change let me see so basically like uh, i've changed the class name to mail fetcher from uh, this uh, gmail quick start one more thing that you need to do is uh, that 
here you have to change this so like here you see they have list of string scopes collection dot singleton list they have gmail scopes dot gmail labels we have to change this from labels to read only because we don't have, want to just see the labels we need to read the mails to get the transactions of gmail underscore read only next you have the private static uh, string uh, part to the credentials files so like uh, if you can provide the path uh, basically if you have stored it in the resources folder like this then it will automatically find like that if it's inside the resources folder and if it's some if, if it's named something else or anything then you can just change the name uh, change the path and yeah you are done with it and then uh, i think some things are not being used here so then they have their uh, get credentials method i think we don't have to do anything with it like it's just copied paste it from here only okay and then what i have done is i have uh, done that here i have in, in here they had their main method because this was their main class i have renamed it to fetch and i have handled a main mail handler here mail handler is an interface so there can be different things here we will be uh, specifically uh, passing a transaction finder but a mail handler i have made an interface so that you can pass anything like uh, maybe sale finder or anything that implements this interface to keep it a bit more like flexible and not tightly couple it with the transaction finder so next we this is all the google stuff and you don't have to dabble into this now here is where uh, you have to change so here they have since they were reading labels as i told you uh, over here they were saying requesting labels so they have list label response so but we have want to read the messages or the mails so we use the list message response list response equals service dot get uh, basically the same thing as they were doing over here but instead of here dot labels we have to change this to dot messages and all the code will be shared with you in the end and then we have the list of labels labels is equal to list response dot get labels list response dot get labels and then uh like they were returning void when i am just returning a list of um, mails i think it's optional so you, you can keep it void also but i have just made a new array list list of type mail and this 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 class mail is made by me and it's not anything that google provides so basically what i do is uh, so this is again this is a bit of google stuff they were doing if labels dot is empty we are doing if messages dot is empty no message is found else what we do is we use a for each loop and we loop for each message and if string uh, mail string is equal to mail str that is mail string is equal to i think they were doing similar things with labels no yeah so it's you have to do this to get the string from the message because or to uh, to basically get the actual content of the message you need to write this service dot users dot messages dot get user message dot get id uh, basically message object comes with some id and all that and then you have to execute and then you have to call the two string method and this user is nothing but me and me means the user who is authenticating through all, all this i will show you what does that mean so let me just show you that what does this me mean basically me, me uh, basically uh, the way it works is so you can see this tokens folder here right so currently if i run the is application uh, it won't I, i will show you uh, right it just starts executing normally 
right but but to basically uh, basically uh, this what i mean is that you are making a generic application which anyone can use and yeah one thing i forgot to uh, share with you that you have to do in the google cloud platform i will show you right now so but the thing is you are making an application that anyone can use and as soon as you run it uh, anyone can log in into it so right now this tokens folder is there because i have already logged into this but if i delete this tokens folder you will see as soon as i click the run button it should it will open my browser and it will take me to gmail and it will ask me to authenticate to allow them to use my gmail so i have to click on my email and then it will say that google has not verified this app and yeah this uh, then you have to click on continue here and then continue and then now they can read my email otherwise they cannot and i can share this application with anyone and anyone can use it so me just means that the current user using this application now and again this tokens folder is automatically created and yeah device is offline because my bolt is offline right now i will show you that so next uh, so next here in the cloud platform one more thing that you need to do is uh, uh, either you can publish your application but that doesn't make sense to do right now so what you can do is you can i think somewhere you need to allow yourself you need to go to oauth consent screen and then like you have to like i have added my email manually here so that i can use this application during testing but if i want to um, use this app during testing before i publish it because i'm not going to publish it anyway but uh, right now so if i want to any other person to use this application uh, hosted from my computer then i have to add their email and then only they will be able to log in when that page appears so i have allowed my email so here again in the gmail apis once you come to the manage section just go to oauth consent screen and add click on add users and add yourself simple next where we are ha huh. so next we get the message and we keep adding this to the list and once all the messages that were fetched were done we return this list and we also call this handler dot event and basically what this handler dot event does is so let me show you so handler dot event so what is this handler well uh, the handler was actually the bolt because here you see transaction handler is implemented by this so as soon uh, wait a second what was no no it was the transaction handler so tran this was the actually handler and then here we have the event method here a mail object was passed then we check if it was null and then we call the tran get transaction event then uh, it checks if there is a transaction and returns that returns a new transaction okay um yeah wait a second so we so yeah this is what the event returns is a second where were we so yeah and actually this transaction finder implements mail handle handler and it takes in a transaction handler and what is our transaction handler our box implements the transaction handler so actually what we do is here in the get transaction method we check if there is a transaction and 
where did i call the yeah so here we did the transaction handler dot transaction event right and we use the get transaction to check if there was a transaction given in the message and if it was we just get the transaction pass into the transaction event which passes it to the box and here we accept this transaction t and if t is not null what we do is we send the transaction kind t dot get kind here and if the transaction is fraudulent we send it from here and uh, yeah i think we are almost done with all the software and let me show you once again yeah transaction yeah so these are the constants it returns and then these constants are returned from the transaction and then uh, using the bold class they are sent sorry bold module class they are using the network manager they are sent to the to the appropriate um, urls and then through the bold to the arduino so uh, now let me show you the video for the uh, project one minute please let me connect my cameras and all that so yeah here is my addressable led led strip i haven't completed the entire box but yeah here is the addressable led strip on which i can individually address all the leds here is the arduino nano and uh, for the wiring just you have to connect the uart lines tx rx rx tx um, you can connect the ground of both of them together but since i'm using the same computer i haven't done that and yeah it's both both module is connecting to wi-fi and yeah you have to connect five volts in ground to the led strip and you have to connect the green wire of the led strip which is the data line and okay now when i will play it it will send when i start running the code uh, it will it will basically um, what it will do is it will send a w so if we can open the serial monitor which there must be just a moment just a moment yeah here is our serial monitor so that's a bit let me just clean up my screen yeah so here is the serial monitor where you see the cursor now what i'm going to do i'm going to run my program and yeah let me tell you about uh, a problem so basically what the problem is is that yeah i haven't showed you one class which was the male polar so male polar basically does what is it repeatedly calls it, calls the male fetcher class that's all it does and so there's a uh, there is one problem that we have the that problem is that um, right now uh, and uh, let me tell you the solution also so basically what's happening is that um, when uh, uh, like uh, what's happening is like if there are uh, very few mails coming so what it does is it scans 100 mails at once and if it sees two uh, the same mail twice then it will detect the transaction for it twice so and uh, like uh, we can just store all these mails in a list and then compare them that they are not repeated but that would be very memory ine inefficient so uh, then basically polling the mail like this is not the uh, uh, correct solution so the correct solution would be a bit complicated that's why i'm not showing here and i haven't done it too that would be using something called as uh, push notifications this this is push notification so basically push notifications you can read about this on this page only so what it does is that it as soon as there is a mail you can create some watch request and all that 
and as soon as there is a new mail it just tells our program that hey there is a new mail just process it so thereby we don't have to keep polling the server and wasting our resources and also we don't have to keep track of repeated mails which is uh, basically a bit memory inefficient so uh, let's run the program so uh, as soon as i'll start it we will see the uh, wi-fi connected animation so let me just give you an idea how will it look like and i'm just going to run it so we'll be flashing the red green blue yellow and white leds and these leds will be from the different parts of the strip okay so let's try this and hope it works so here we run the program yeah so you saw you saw it was really quick and now it's going to read my mails and find a transaction and based on the kind of transaction like there was a green flash so what did that mean yeah it, and it's flashing yeah there were white flashes too so it's basically re reading through all my past mails and all that that's why it will keep showing <coughs> that and it's basically going on and on on the same mails and so that's a problem but you can read about push notification and fix it so yeah that's how it works and here are all the animations all and all that so now um any questions